called us before the world began to glorify your name. We were without hope and dead inside, but you chose to save our lives. Who are we, Lord, that you would be mindful of us? Who are we that you would come to us in the form of a man to be tempted in every way we have, yet never sin? Try you, God. You stoop down to us in Jesus. Lord, you had absolutely no need to put up with and deal with rebellious, ungrateful, unappreciative creatures who were your enemies. But in your amazing grace, in your amazing grace that we sing of, Lord, by your glorious mercy that we stand upon, you chose a specific people for no other reason than your good pleasure, that we might glorify you, dear God. Oh, Lord Jesus, you have called us before the world began to glorify your name. We were without hope and dead inside, Lord, but you chose to save our lives. Lord, your affections for us can be so radically foreign to us that instead of embracing it, we question it. Instead of joyfully receiving your grace, we look for flawed understandings because our human mind simply cannot process the fact that those whom you foreknew, you also predestined to be conformed to the image of your Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And Lord, those whom you predestined, you also called. And those whom you called, you also justified. And those whom you justified, you also glorified. Speak to us this afternoon, Lord, by way of your Holy Spirit. And help us to understand that we bring absolutely nothing to our salvation except the very sin that made it necessary. Help us to make this about you and not our feelings or emotions. May your preached word this afternoon convict our hearts. Help us to repent of our sins, O oh Lord. And Father, please forgive me of my own sins, for they are many. Would you now please remove any distractions from us that would hinder us truly paying attention to what you have for us this afternoon. We pray this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all those who love him shout loudly, Amen. <laughs> Please be seated in the presence of the Lord, friends. Bless Lord's Day to your family. Bless Lord's Day. It is so good to be here in the house of the Lord at RCLA with the saints as we've gathered today to call to worship our triune God. We've confessed our sin and been reminded that in Christ we're forgiven. Amen? Amen. We've confessed together the articles of the historic Apostles' Creed stating exactly what it is that we believe. And we've also been reminded of the canons of Dork, those things that we reject. And now we continue our summer doctrinal teachings as we continue the study of the doctrines of grace spelled out in the acrostic tulip. Last week, Reverend Chris taught us about total depravity or medical corruption. You remember? For the six of you that remember, praise God. He taught us about total depravity and radical corruption that from a reformed view means that the effects of the fall extended or penetrate to the very core of our being. In other words, the phrase or term original sin doesn't refer to the fall itself, but that the doctrine of original sin defines the consequences to the human race because of that first sin. And as our federal head or our federal representative Adam passed this disease on to us. That all of his posterior, all of his descendants will carry from their court. And the disease of sin has no vaccine that, that can cure other than the shed blood of Christ. You with me? Yep. Are you with me? Yeah. Ain't no vaccine that can cure sin like the blood of Jesus. There is no other. I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Yeah. And today we come to what is known as the youth. In TULA, it stands for unconditional election. It addresses the concept of predestination or God's sovereign choice. I read this definition and found it to be very practical and simple. Listen to how it reads. It says, the reformed view of election, known as unconditional election, means that, pay attention, God does not foresee 
an action or a condition on our part that induces him to save us. Instead, the election rests on God's sovereign decision to save, to save whomever he is pleased to save. In other words, it is God's plan, not ours. In other words, God doesn't choose based on anything we've done or will do. Let me make it clear, there is absolutely nothing that any one of us can do to save ourselves. Are we on the same page so far? Yes? yes. Now some people will say that we disagree with, that we have something called free will. And we do have free will. Okay, we do have free will. Let me explain. I see Elder Steve in the back shaking his head. We do have free will. We can choose what to order at the restaurant that we go to. We can choose who we'll marry. Sometimes we make the wrong choice, not me. We can choose what career we want to work in. We can choose what socks to wear or what car to buy. But pay attention, no person ever has or ever will be able to choose God outside of God choosing him first. You hear me? No dead person can get up alive on their own. The Bible taught us that when Jesus went, he resurrected Lazarus after having been dead for four days. In the same way, no spiritually dead person can make themselves alive on their own without the touch of God first. Now, I know some of us may have a hard time understanding this. I had a hard time understanding this because I was in my feelings without having studied the Lord's Bible, without having studied His Word. So I want to make sure that, that although your feelings may be conflicted, we may be struggling with this important doctrine inside, know that you are not the only one. But the truth is, the veracity or the truth of God's word does not rest on your feelings. I am not trying to be condescending. I am not trying to be a jerk. But the truth is, the word of God does not depend on our feelings. You know how emotionally unstable many of us are? And I raised my hand the first one. Imagine if God's word rested on our feelings. One minute we're up, one minute we're down, the next minute we don't know what the heck is going on. God's word does not depend upon our feelings. Isaiah 55, 8 tells us that neither God's thoughts nor God's ways are our ways, but his and his alone. Amen? We heard last week that in our unregenerated selves, because of our depravity, none of us would come to Christ on our own. None. But God uses the gospel to draw us unto himself in our natural state. I know some of us think we're really good people. In our natural state, we are all enemies of God and want absolutely nothing to do with him. Nothing. But somehow, some way, God will use something said, something sung, something prayed, but especially his gospel be preached to, not only to draw his people in, but to save them. Today as we talk about God's unconditional election, I want to be very clear, and I don't want to confuse the terms. I want to make sure that we know what we're talking about today and what we're not talking about today. About how we're being saved, which we know comes forth from faith in Christ. How are we saved? We're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And we know that through the scriptures alone. Amen? That's what we'll be addressing today. How do we come to saving faith? But first, let's get the dirty laundry out there. Is that okay? The statement, that's not fair, is not valid. It is not acceptable, as we discuss this very important doctrine, and you'll soon see why. Studying the doctrine of election should challenge your preconceived notions that you might have. What it will do is make it very clear that it is God who chooses and God that does what he wants to do. Somebody asked me why. I'm so glad you asked. Because he's God. And God can do whatever he wants. Who are we to question God? I don't mean question God like the psalmist did, like Job did. But I mean, when we want to question one of the authority, who do you think you are? God? But the question is, who do you think you are, oh man? Amen? So let's not get it twisted and think that 
that God would never do this or never do that because it's not fair. The very fact that God even stooped down to save a bunch of ratchet folks like us, that's not fair. That's not fair. So let's not get it twisted. I pray that by the time we're done today, you would feel more comfortable because this doctrine is true and because it would make us bold and fearless as we proclaim the gospel to people and in places who hate God the way we once did. It should humble us too. Remember, get out of the cage. It should humble us too. Being reminded of God's kindness and mercy towards us, it should make us humble. As it motivates us as believers to evangelize and to be used by God to reach His people. Amen? Amen? Now let's get to it. Please open up your Bibles to the epistle from Paul to the Romans. We'll be reading this afternoon Romans 9, verses 6 through 24. Can you please stand with me in body and spirit for the reading of God's word from Romans 9, verses 6 through 24. Let me get an amen when you're there. Amen. And the word of God reads as follows, man, from Romans 9, 6 through 24. Now it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Neither is it the case that all of Abraham's children are his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. For this is a statement of the promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children of one man, our father Isaac. For though her sons had not been born yet, or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, that I may display my power in you, and that by my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O human being, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? On us, the ones he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. People of God, this is the word of God. Be God. Please be seated, friends. Sorry for the sound effects. My big idea for this afternoon is really simple. We bring nothing to our salvation other than the sin that made it necessary. It's all about God, not us. Let me say that one more time in case you blink. We bring nothing to our salvation except the very sin that made it necessary. It is all about God, not us. The doctrine of unconditional election is not like when you were in preschool or in elementary school getting picked for kingdom. When you were good, you were the first to get picked. And if you weren't good, you were the last to get picked. The doctrine of election is not about 
elementary schools. The doctrine of unconditional election starts with a sovereign and a holy God that doesn't need anyone or require anything. He exists on his own, he always has, and he is superior to all because he created everything. He knows all things, he sees all things, he's in all places and at all times, and he's all powerful. God does not need us. He doesn't get from us what we should be giving him all the time. You know what he gets from us? He gets a headache. He has a bunch of spoiled, needy kids who are super, super dependent, who are super needy. He could have left us all alone in our trespasses as we were on our way to hell in a handbasket, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to save some, that he would be glorified in the midst of it. He chose to save some by way of his mercy, his grace, which means it was his unmerited favor, which means we didn't work for it, so we don't deserve it. Isn't this mind-blowing that God would give you something you don't deserve? For me, when I finally got my fat head wrapped around this doctrine of unconditional election, it blew my mind. Why would God choose to save a ratchet fool like me? Why? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. If you haven't thought about that, I'm worried. Because that makes us think that we're good people and we deserve what God has given us because we do good things. That is not how we are saved. Not by doing good things. Now that's the million dollar question right there. Why would God even bother? Do you have another microphone? Why would God even bother saving us? Why? Why would God bother saving us? And that's the million dollar question. But there are essentially two ways to view and two ways to understand election, which raises some questions. Now here are the two views or understanding regarding election. Are you ready? The first view, it's conditional election. God, before the foundation of the world, he looked down the corridor of time to see who would respond favorably at his calling, and he would then elect only those that would respond favorably. He would only elect those who would respond favorably. As he looked down the corner of time, those were the people that would be the elect. Now, the reform view, that we believe the unconditional election, what we believe is this, is that God, before the foundation of the world, chose some to be saved due to no merit of their own, no works of their own, and no foreseeable action. The choice is God's decision alone to save whomever he is pleased to save. Are you with me? And these two views, they raise the same questions on either side. And the, the non-reformed view would say that, one, why did God only save some and not all? It's not fair. Why would God only save some and not save all? And that's a legit question. The other question, the reform view would ask, why would God even save anybody? One view says, why would God not save everybody? And the other question says, why would God even bother to save anyone, period? And that's what we want to answer today. But before we get into these two questions, how about we break down this passage briefly and set things up that we might have a better understanding of why God used the Apostle Paul to write this specific doctrine and letter and put it in place where he did. Let's answer these three questions first. And the first is this. In verse 6 we read, Did God's word fail by not saving everybody? The second question we'll answer from verse 14. Is there injustice with God because not everybody will be saved? And the third comes to us from verse 19. Why then does God still blame us for not believing and not being saved? Why then does God blame us for not believing and being saved? Let me repeat my big idea once again. We bring nothing to our salvation other than the very sin that made it necessary. It's all about God. It's not about us, friends. So what does this have to do with God's unconditional election of his people? Did God keep his word? Did his promises to Israel fail? Let's see. In verse 6, we'll ask the question, did God's word fail? 
Now, it is not as though the word of God has failed. Let me say that again. It is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Paul asked the question, and he immediately answered it. It is not as though the word of God has failed. God has kept and will always keep his promises. At least the true Israel is church, not national Israel. We read in verses 11 through 12 that Paul explains this by referring back to Rebekah and her twin sons by saying this, pay attention. Though her sons had not yet been born or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand. Not from works, but from the one who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. In other words, God chose the younger to serve the older, which was totally contradictory to Jewish custom. The older son always received the first blessing or the inheritance. But here, before the twins were even born, before they had done anything good or bad, God had already chosen the younger instead. But that's not fair, Rev. Why did God choose? Let's read verse 11 again. So that God's purpose, according to election, might stand. That's why he chose. So that God's purpose, according to election, might stand. So if God alone chooses, why do those who don't respond favorably to the gospel still get punished? And that brings up a second question. Is God then unjust? Verse 14. Is there injustice with God? What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? How does he answer? Absolutely not. Not just a no. Absolutely not. A resounding no with an exclamation point behind it. How is that fair? It's simple. All human beings are sinful, and we are all guilty in God's sight. Remember, last week, Rev. Chris taught and showed us about total depravity. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God is not unjust to save some and not all. Because all of us want nothing to do with him until he regenerates us. Before he gives us the gift of faith, none of us want anything to do with him. And when he does, then we have a desire for him. Now, if you're asking yourself, well, then why are those people still held accountable who do not turn to God? That's a very good question. And it takes us to verse 19 in our third point. Why then does God blame us? Verse 19 reads, You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who resists his will? In other words, why then does God still hold us accountable? And the answer comes to us in the following verses. Who are you, O human being, to talk back to God? Who do you think you are talking back to God? Well, what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Or has a potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath, to make his power known, endured with much patience the objects of wrath, prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand on us, the ones he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? In other words, who do we think we're talking to? Have we forgotten that we're talking to a holy God? Have we forgotten that we're talking to the being that created everything that is anything? We're talking about the one that created absolutely everything. The one that put the moon and the stars in the sky. The God who parted the Red Sea for his people to escape the Egyptians. The very God who calmed the wind and the waves. The very God who healed thousands of people, the very God who fed thousands of people with just a few fish and a few loaves. And if this God has chosen to, out of all his own free will and pleasure, to mercifully save some who were not worthy of being saved, that makes him good. That makes him merciful, and it makes him compassionate, not unfair. 
unfair is this? Why did he even save any to begin with? So to be clear, to recap this brief message. One, friends, God's word has never failed. Two, God is not unjust to not save everyone. And three, God does not remove punishment from unrepentant sinners. Period. He doesn't harden soft hearts. Let me say that again. God does not harden a soft heart. He allows hardened hearts to be hardened even more so. Just like he did with Pharaoh. He is just and he is righteous. So that means he will enforce punishment on those who deserve it. Which is all of us. But the game changer is this, that in his goodness, he chose to save some. For no reason other than his good pleasure. And for that, he is amazing. For that, we should focus our time on being grateful and not questioning such a great mercy over that authority that he exemplified. We should be burdened to share this gospel with everyone who we come into contact with because we don't know who is elect and who isn't. The doctrine of God's unconditional election does raise some questions, as I mentioned earlier. It raises concerns, and I want to make sure that we address those too. Let's go back to the two questions I asked earlier. Why did God only save some and not all? And two, why would God even save anybody, period? The first question, why did God only save some and not all? I think we made it clear today that God didn't have to save anybody. None deserved to be saved. None came to God prior to his regenerating our hearts. Verse 15 clearly states, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The truth, friends, is this. We've got to get it clear. God doesn't owe us anything. God does not owe us anything. There are just certain things that we will never understand. And that is something I love about our Reformed faith, our Reformed tradition, that we know when to admit we just don't know. We don't we're not scared of admitting that is one of God's mysteries that we will never have clear this side of glory. And we're okay with saying that we don't know. But what we do know, we clearly see or deduce from Scripture. And this is where our biggest problem lies at times. We want to hold our feelings and our emotions higher than the authority of Scripture. Let me hit you with something really quick to get things back into perspective. You with me? Matthew 22, 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Second question. Why would God even save anybody? This is the bigger question right here. But let's put qualifications and criteria for God choosing who to save on hold for now. Let's help reframe this perspective by putting things in logical order. And this begs a question as to why would God even consider saving anybody from you? In the Old Testament, we can see the same rebellious story over and over. But first, can I hit you with the real? Why did God even choose Israel first? We can say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair to the Egyptians, Rev. Why did God choose Israel, not the Egyptians? Well, yeah, let's add to that. Why did God choose the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Parasites? Parasites, not Parasites. We can say that's just not fair. But friends, God specifically chose the people of Israel. He later included the Gentiles, meaning us. And we see in Scripture that ultimately true Israel is the universal church, not the country of Israel. So what do we do with this? Well, one, we either believe what Scripture says or we don't. That, that's the gist of it. Either we believe what Scripture says in its totality, or we don't. If we do, we're going to struggle with some tough things. And if we don't, that's a whole other story. We either take the Scriptures in its totality and struggle with the difficult doctrines, or we begin to cherry-pick the parts we like, and we discard the rest. And that is dangerous. That is dangerous. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What is Scripture for, Rev? All scripture. You catch that? 
all scripture, not just the parts you like, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Catch that. Scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for our teaching. It is, prof it is profitable because it exposes our rebellion, it corrects our mistakes, and it trains us to live God's way. Through the Word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks that God has given us. Almighty God has given us his word. The creator of all things stooped down to speak to us. The all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-places God chose for no other reason than his good pleasure to not let all of his creation enter eternal damnation. And in his mercy, he has graced some of us for his glory. And that is not unfair. It is beautiful that even though none of us should be saved at all, because he is good, some of us are saved. Friends, we bring nothing to our salvation other than the very sin that made it necessary. It's about God. It's not about us. So what does this look like practically in our life? I've got a challenge for you. And the challenge is this. Embrace God's grace in your election. Knowing that it wasn't because of anything you've done, but His grace alone. And be burdened to share His gospel message with the world. Let's start at home. Embrace God's grace in your election. No, it wasn't because of anything you've done, but His grace alone. And be burdened to share the gospel with everybody to start at home. I've got a few suggestions for us this afternoon to help us embrace God's grace. But remember that God choosing us isn't something we should dwell on questioning too long. Instead, live into it to our fullest and share His good news with everyone. Because we just don't know who is who. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, if God would have painted a yellow stripe on the backs of the elect, I would go around lifting shirts. But since he didn't, I must preach. Whosoever will and whatsoever believes, I know that he is one of the elect. Amen? We can't go around lifting people's shirts up to see that, that yellow line that's not there. So what do we do? We promiscuously preach the gospel to everyone. We let God figure out the details. You feel me? Yeah? You preach the gospel promiscuously. What does promiscuously mean? To everybody and to anybody. Some folks can object, object to say, well, then why even bother evangelizing? That's a really good question. Why bother evangelizing if God has already chosen who's going to saved and who's not. And it deserves a fair answer. But I'm going to give you an answer from God, not from me. So what does God say? God says this. Out of Romans 10, 13-17. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have never heard of? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Amen? That's why we preach the gospel for this reason. Because faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is why we evangelize. Christ told us in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion, in the Great Commission, in other words, you must do this. He told us to therefore go out and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like we did yesterday at the beach, and we will be doing it today again. Now, a legit concern could be like, hey, Rev, I'm, I'm scared, I'm nervous. Hold up, Jesus said a little bit more. If you're scared and you're nervous to evangelize, this is what he said. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's not our job to convert people, but it is our job to be bold. It is our job to be faithful to the scriptures and to share the gospel of Christ explicitly. It is our job to study and wrestle with scripture, to have a proper understanding of God's word, and to teach it accordingly. 
So as it pertains to God's election or predestination, we can ignore that from the very beginning. God showed us this by choosing Israel. We have to consider all the other scriptures that teach about this as well. Ephesians 1.5 says that he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the, to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now we still have a doubt, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that fruit should abide. Friends, Jesus is the man that healed the sick. Jesus is the man that gave sight to the blind. Jesus is the man who fed the hungry. Jesus is the man who raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. This is the man that we want to introduce to our friends and to our family and to the world. Amen? Be bold. Know the word. Not all the parts of the Bible are easy to understand. We must wrestle with those difficult doctrines. The Bible is not a, a pack of skills. We can't just focus on the flavors we like. It's a package deal, friends. Let us struggle with the truth of God's word. We want our friends and family to know that the God who sent his absolute best to pay for our worst, that if we believe in him, we'd be saved. Saved from what? Someone asked me. Well, so glad that you asked. Let me break down the gospel message in case you've never heard. God created everything good. He gave Adam and Eve one job to do, and they failed. And because of their sin in the garden, every single one of us is born into sin. And we are dead in our trespasses. In the same way a dead person cannot get up on their own, neither can we when we're spiritually dead. And the only one that can make us rise from being spiritually dead to spiritual life is Christ, the Son of God. Now we can sit here in our feelings and say, that's not fair that you wouldn't save everybody. Or we can be thankful that he chose us. Because God is sovereign, these things are out of our hands, bro. And they're in His hands alone. Do you want to waste time questioning why God would save some? Or do you want to accept the scriptures as being true and do everything you can to tell everyone about this Christ? You see, the gospel teaches that our own free volition cannot and will not submit to God to His law. Our sin keeps us from following His law. And because God is fair, because he in fact is just and righteous, his word tells us that our sins against him must be punished. This means that when we die, and every single person will stand before God when they be judged. And because, because we were not able to follow his law perfectly, every single one of us deserves eternal punishment. Let me let you marinate on that for a second. Because every single one of us has not been able to follow his message perfectly, we will stand before God condemned. That's bad news, right? That's bad news. That's not good news. But you see, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, he did follow the law perfectly. He came into the very world that he created. He was tempted in every way we were, yet he never sinned. He suffered willingly on the cross to die for his people, those whom he foreknew, those whom he predestined. That when they believe, they be saved. He didn't have to do this, but he did. And that's what makes him a good God. Jesus paid the price for our sin. You see, when we stand before God in judgment, friends, I told you that we'll all be found guilty. And every single one of us owes a debt to God. And someone has to pay for it. Who's it going to be? That's an even bigger question. Who's it going to be? It's either going to be us, or it's going to be Jesus. Friends, believe upon the Lord Jesus and be saved. Believe upon the Lord Jesus and be saved. Trust in what he did on the cross for you and know that you did not deserve it. And hold on to his promises like a pit bull to a pork chop. Hold on to his promises like a pit bull to a pork chop and do not let them go. If there's one thing you can take from the bank from our little church, is that we won't steer you wrong with the Word of God. We won't twist up the Word of God to our convenience. We'll deal with the difficult doctrines too. 
because God gave them to us. Around here, you know that we don't twist scriptures, we twist turos, right? And I want to close with the words of the Belgic Confession written over 500 years ago. Listen to how it speaks to what we've been talking about today. It's written 500 years ago. The Belgic Confession, Article 16 reads, We believe that all of Adam's descendants, having thus fallen into perdition and ruined by sin of the first man, God showed himself to be as he is, merciful and just. He is merciful in withdrawing and saving from this perdition those whom he in his eternal and unchangeable counsel has elected and chosen in Jesus Christ our Lord by his pure goodness. Without any consideration of the works, he is just in leaving the others in the ruin and fall into which they plunge themselves. Amen? Let's pray. Triune God, we, we know that since all people have sinned in Adam and have come under the sentence of the curse of eternal death, you would have done no one an injustice if it had been your will to leave the entire human race in sin and under the curse, and to condemn them on account of their sin. But Lord, in order that people might be brought to faith, you mercifully have given us your gospel, and you send proclaimers of this very joyful and truthful message to the people whom you wish and at the time you wish. By this ministry, people are called to repentance and faith in Christ crucified. Would you help us today, O oh Lord, to be proclaimers of your truth? Please strengthen us to be obedient to your word, to not question your word, but to truly make it an effort to understand it, to be obedient to it, and to serve you by proclaiming it. We pray this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all those who love you shout it. Amen.